Greetings, Internet. Today I want you to imagine that you're about to get into a fight, and your opponent is bigger and stronger than you, so there's no way you're going to win. But what if there was a way to have your opponent destroy himself all on his own? That brings us to reflexive control, a Russian military strategy. The idea is you give your enemies bad information in order to change their beliefs or psychological state so that self-destructive actions that may have been unthinkable prior to your interference are now on the table. This requires you to imagine your enemy as a machine, a machine that intakes information, processes it, and then spits out a behavior. A reflexive control operation seeks to reverse engineer this machine. You have to decide what you want your enemy's output behavior to be. You then have to understand how your enemy's machine works, especially any fears that might make it act self-destructively. Then figure out what information weapons you can implant into that machine to get the desired behavior. And then you execute. Granted, this is a simple machine, but what if your adversary was something a bit more complicated, like an entire country? Russia has been executing an increasingly effective information war campaign against the United States. And yet, it's been really difficult for the American government to mount up any kind of coordinated defense. And perhaps it's because Americans can't really get their minds wrapped around what their vulnerabilities are and what the danger really is. Most people don't even believe that advertising changes their behavior, let alone political disinformation. So it's hard to really take it seriously. So let's find an example of how effective information warfare can be. And to make it easier to break down, we need to find a campaign that targeted a smaller country and before Russia had smoothed out the edges to their strategy. And that brings us to Estonia, 2007. Estonia is a small country of about 1.3 million people. In April of 2007, Estonia had the biggest riot their country has ever seen. While also being the victim of the first coordinated cyber attack recorded in human history. This is a large amount of chaos for this tiny country to be suddenly experiencing all at once. So pretty quickly there were suspicions that Russia, Estonia's hostile neighbor, might have something to do with this. The cyber attack was almost immediately traced back to a Russian IP address, but there's still conflicting opinions about whether the Russian government coordinated the attack directly or just encouraged independent hackers to do the job for them. But what is directly observable is the Russian government's use of information to stoke the outrage that helped incite the riots. Let's play the reflexive control game ourselves, level by level. And along the way, we'll see how Russia launched a simple but aggressive information attack on its much smaller neighbor to start a riot, and how that riot could be used in a bigger picture campaign to reflexively control Russia's other rivals. And finally, this story shows the weaknesses that could be exploited in your homeland today. Let's imagine that we're playing as the Russian Federation in 2007. What are our goals and what are we worried about? Well, the same thing we've been worried about for the past 60 years, NATO. NATO is an alliance formed in 1949, originally comprised of 12 countries attempting to counterbalance the growing power of the Soviet Union. The core of the alliance is Article 5, which says that an attack on one country is an attack on all of them. This alliance continued to expand over the years, even after the Soviet Union collapsed. But it was the expansion in 2004 that had Russia extra nervous. That's when NATO accepted a group of former Soviet countries called the Baltic States. This put the alliance right up against Russia's border and had the Russian government feeling increasingly surrounded by enemies. So if we're playing as Russia, the first step in the reflexive control game is to figure out what we want our enemies to do next. What output do we want this machine of countries to give us? This is all highly speculative, so let's just throw stuff out there. I guess, best case scenario, we would want NATO to shrink, or at least that existing members are less certain of the alliance's value, so they reduce their commitment to it. But that's a really tall order, so we'd be happy if NATO was just more hesitant to expand further. 
because we really don't want the alliance to include these countries. And at the very least, we'd like to keep our neighboring countries weaker than us. The ideal information campaign would move us closer to all three of these goals. Let's say we focused our resources on destabilizing the Baltic states. We could knock out goal number one. If this instability is bad enough, it might spook the rest of the alliance as if their expansion was a bit too hasty and make them more cautious about expanding even further in the future. And if this instability provides enough ugly material for a long media event, it might prompt outrage in the populations of these countries, chipping away at the perceived value of the alliance itself. Okay, so we have our goal. We're gonna try to destabilize at least one of these countries, but our tactics to accomplish this are pretty limited. Remember Article 5, we can't be caught overtly attacking any one of these countries, or the entire alliance will be forced to declare war on us. So we need to be on the lookout for naturally occurring divisions within our targets that we can subtly exploit. Lucky for us, in 2007, an opportunity presents itself. In 2007, Estonia's population was composed primarily of two major ethnicities, ethnic Estonians and ethnic Russians. Tensions between these groups began to coalesce around a bronze monument in the country's capital. Why is this statue so divisive? The monument's symbolism centers around the Soviet Union's contribution to the end of World War II, and whether the Soviet Union should be remembered as liberators or occupiers in Estonia. Back at the peak of Hitler's power, the Nazis had occupied Estonia along with much of Eastern Europe. But the Nazis' conquest was finally halted by the Soviet Union's Red Army, who would eventually push the Nazis back into Germany. This was a decisive moment in World War II, and it would eventually lead to liberating Eastern Europe from Nazi control. But the Soviet Union's reputation as liberators gets sullied by what happens next. As the Nazis were fleeing the advancing Soviet army, Estonians seized the opportunity to assert their independence by raising the national flag and forming a sovereign government. But when the Red Army arrives, the had Estonian leadership arrested and swiftly turned Estonia into a Soviet satellite state. The Soviet Union would then attempt to systematically russify the population. What does it mean to russify a population? Well, you force tens of thousands of Estonians, primarily women and children, onto cattle cars for mass deportation to harsh and isolated regions in the Soviet Union where many would die. And then you bring trains filled with native Russians in to replace them. And then you repeat. From 1934 to 1989, the share of Estonians living in Estonia plummets. When Estonia finally became independent from the Soviet Union, there are two indelible legacies left a population of Russian-speaking transplants, and monuments built by the Soviet Union which mean two different things to each of their major ethnic populations, one of glory and liberation, and one of occupation and suffering. By 2007, these two populations were fairly segregated, but even in more integrated areas like the capital city of Tallinn, there was little contact between Estonians and Russians through friendship and social networks. Many of the ethnic Russians living in Estonia didn't even speak Estonian, which means they were isolated from the rest of the population in their own Russian-speaking information bubbles. 75% of them had to get their information from television programs broadcast from Russia, produced by stations directly controlled by the Russian government. The average Russian speaker in Estonia spent four hours and 49 minutes in front of these channels. In hindsight, having a major portion of your population living in a completely different information environment, one that was dictated by a foreign government, seems like a really bad idea. A survey taken around that time shows how sharply the historical perspectives of these two groups had diverged. For example, ethnic Russians living in Estonia were way more likely to agree with statements like, Stalin may have made mistakes, but overall he did more good than bad or the collapse of the USSR was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 21st century. The bronze statue became the perfect focal point for these tensions to play out because the monument was built by the Soviet Union to celebrate their fallen soldiers of World War II, and it has several Soviet soldiers buried underneath it. So the monument carries way more emotional resonance for Soviet Union veterans and their families. At the same time, the monument is located in the center of the capital city of Tallinn. 
So when Russian Estonians travel to celebrate that heritage carrying these Soviet Union flags, it's easily visible to any Estonians who might see these as symbols of their former occupiers. Clashes between the two groups began to escalate. In January of 2007, the Estonian government decided on a compromise. They wouldn't destroy the monument the way the Estonian nationalists want, but they wouldn't keep it in the city center the way the ethnic Russians wanted either. Instead, they would move the memorial into a military cemetery nearby. It's no longer in the center of the city, but it's only 1.5 miles away, literally a 35 minute walk. The Estonian government hoped that this would stop the monument from being a staging ground for violent political demonstrations. And while they were expecting some minor protests, there didn't seem to be a reason to worry about a major backlash. But if you're Russia, this is exactly the opportunity you've been looking for. Bitte nasze pamięć, to pamięć o naszych dzieciach. I a na samym dziele problem nastolko mnogo. Well, well, well. There is a group of Russian-speaking protesters who are planning on demonstrating around the monument the day it's moved. But there's not enough of them, is there? Not even enough for a major protest, let alone to destabilize the entire country. So it's time to step in. We'll use our media dominance with the Russian-speaking population to create a narrative that can boost these numbers. What information weapons can we plant to ensure that not only more people show up to protest, but that they arrive angry? First, we need to modify the narrative. The actual story that the Estonian government is moving the monument 1.5 miles away to a dedicated war cemetery as a compromise isn't very motivating. It might even seem reasonable. So we need to change the story. Now, if the statue was being destroyed, that would feel a bit more threatening. Это ни много ни мало государственная тайна, и теперь никто не узнает, когда начнут демонтировать памятник и раскапывать братские могилы. After we've tweaked the story itself, we'll need to give it a stronger meaning. It can't just be an attack on some piece of metal, but on all of history, a history that our Russian-speaking audience considers a source of pride, their ancestors' contribution to the downfall of Nazism. We need to frame this as an assault on that legacy. By this point, the story and its meaning should be completely reframed. Now we need to spend the next few weeks hammering in that feeling of outrage constantly. And bam! Estonia's capital is flooded with protesters. This is the media event we've been hoping for and the probability of disorder rises. Next, we need to help spark the violence. The situation shouldn't need much. Remember, we're building off of existing historic tensions. And these protesters are already angry. They just need a little push. The best tool for this job may be a bit of emotionally heightened disinformation. На Тальской площади тыни смяги больше нет бронзового солдата. Памятник разрезали на части и увезли куда неизвестно. Obviously, that never happened, but we have to make it look like it did. And if we're lucky, it will all come together. Now mobs get out of control very quickly and the narrative will start to get money really fast because no one is going to be on their best behavior. So this next part is very important. We need to drive the narrative and make sure that we have control over who are the good guys and who are the villains. We can't have any gray area. In our story, the protesters are the heroes. So we don't want to focus on any of the footage coming in of the looting. This is just not a good look. Instead, we need to focus on instances of police violence. 
If we find a good one, we need to air it over and over again. Полиция явно превысила полномочия. Жестокость которой только усилилась. Сейчас городские власти уверяют, что ситуация под контролем, но в их заявлениях нет уверенности, что погромы не повторятся. And if we don't find a real specific horror story of police violence to help sell this, we'll need to invent one. Полиция крайне жестко разгоняла людей, и вот по словам очевидцев, один из них утверждает, что прямо на его глазах убили человека, тело сразу вынесли. It doesn't matter if this person even exists, because the feeling of police overreaction helps the riot's momentum go into a second day. And as the riots go into their second night, a well-timed cyber attack from Russian hackers will shut down financial, government, and media institutions, hopefully increasing the spread of chaos. So how did the story end? The riot fizzled out after two days. The cyber attack created a nuisance for three weeks, but the damage was minimal. The bronze statue along with the graves of the Soviet soldiers were respectfully transported to their new home and given a memorial service in which both ethnic Estonian and ethnic Russians came to pay their respects. So was this a failure for Russia? Remember the bigger picture. Reflexive control operates on a long-term time horizon. And if you're thinking long-term, then this small incident yielded an incredible amount of value as an experiment. Russia got to see how much damage it could do without putting a single soldier on the ground. This could have been a minor conflict. A boring bureaucratic transfer of a World War II artifact instead became the focal point of a massive riot that exacerbated divisions within Estonia's capital city. And all it took was a focused use of distorted or false information to inflame pre-existing tensions. And the footage from this event was used by the Russian media to try and frame Estonia's overall narrative for the world for years to come. Закон о памятниках противоречит общеевропейским ценностям. Они, напомню, Лавров лежат в основе ЕС и НАТО, куда Эстонию приняли совсем недавно. Former Soviet countries as having a different value system than the rest of NATO, and that they don't quite belong in the alliance, and to stain NATO's self image to gradually erode its sense of purpose. If it helped build any momentum whatsoever towards that massive goal, this would be a success. Soon after this event, Russia's military would begin to shift their resources to information warfare. Specifically noting that targeting the protest potential of an enemy nation's own people could be as effective as military force. So it's important to understand what makes a society an easy target. If your society has deep partisan or tribal divisions, especially if these groups live in completely different information environments, you are vulnerable. Estonia has taken that lesson seriously and has been working to heal the divisions within their own society. Estonian TV producers created a Russian language station to hopefully break Russia's monopoly on news information. The Estonian government is investing heavily in arts programs to enrich the cities with big ethnic Russian populations and bring Estonian and Russian artists together. So Estonia is trying to strengthen themselves against any attack that would aim to destroy them from within. But what about your country? Well, if you live in the United States, at a time when the country is increasingly polarized, when its two political parties can only agree that they cannot agree on basic facts, where each segment of the population is increasingly living in a completely different news environment. If you're playing the reflexive control game, how juicy of a target is that? Whoa.